So we're going to talk today about how to make a presentation that's otter this world. And, and one way that I like to personalize my presentations is to kind of put uh, humor into my presentation slides. And I use Canva a lot to do that. So I, you know, photoshopped a, a picture of an otter that's got rocket boosters on its feet and it's, it's um, taking itself right on out of uh, the atmosphere into outer space. So, uh, you know, feel free to, to emulate this kind of thing. I think students tend to appreciate a little bit of levity wherever you can fit it into your topic. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, tips for getting started with your uh, PowerPoints, how to um, minimize the amount of text that we're showing to our students on or uh, for a presentation like this, minimizing that text and maybe some alternative ways you can get around that. Uh, some, some ideas for formatting your presentations that will make them flow a little bit better, make them look a little bit better, and then help you present better. And then we'll have some uh, strategies for actually presenting. I'm not going to talk too much about the actual presentation strategies. We have another site session later this week where uh, Dave Wolf's going to really talk about that, and he'll, he'll do a much better job than me at that. He's, he's a definite born presenter in that manner. So what makes a good PowerPoint? I mean, the answer to that is it really depends on the audience to whom you're presenting, the information that you're trying to give, convey, and um, the, the kind of context of that meeting. So a more formal presentation might need to look a certain way. A less formal presentation could certainly look, look another way. So you might not want to use as many memes when you're presenting to your boss, but you might want to add a little bit more humor, a little bit more flair when you're presenting to peers and or uh, students, et cetera. So when you're considering what makes that great PowerPoint and you're considering the context, that's when you kind of Think about what kind of visuals you want to add, what type of content are you going to add, and, and the overall objective of your, your presentation. And that's going to dictate ultimately what your PowerPoint presentation ends up looking like, or slides, you know, whichever one, uh, if you're using Google Slides or a Mac product. Ultimately, it's the same thing. Uh, not the same program, but the same uh, kind of look and feel to, to what you're presenting to your audience. The, um, you, you definitely want to keep your audience in mind. You don't want to be presenting a certain type of information in a certain way to the wrong group of people. You'll either turn them off, you might insult them, et cetera. So you, you definitely want to keep all of them, that in mind when you're making your PowerPoint. So let's talk about getting started. And the best way to get started is with an outline. The same way that they made you write your papers when you were in grade school is the same way you should start with your PowerPoint presentations. There's nothing worse than getting started with your uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I'm just gonna shorten that to presentation, by the way. Uh, nothing worse than getting started with your presentation and you've made you know, 10 or 20 slides and then you realize that you're not really talking about it in the way that you want. And I speak from experience because despite the fact that I've given this presentation before, I still don't listen to myself sometimes. I didn't start with an outline and a presentation that I did earlier today, and I ended up having to revamp it entirely. So you can kind of lose track of main points and um, then you have to rework everything. So Start with an outline, keep track of what those main points are, chunk out the information into segments that will make sense to your audience that help you tell a story from start to finish. And as you're doing that, it's important to remember what's called a chunking rule. And we're gonna talk about this more depth in more depth tomorrow in part two of our learning and our, our science of learning presentation, what chunking is. But what it essentially boils down to is our short-term or working memories have a very limited capacity and how much information it can hold. And you wanna remember that in terms of your audience. And so, because we can only hold anywhere between five to nine items or, or seven, if you wanna say that our short-term memory is the magic number of seven, um, you wanna to try to limit how much information you're presenting to an audience member at any given point of time. So remember that chunking rule and, and, and by dividing up information into these chunks, it makes it more digestible. It makes it easier for our, our brains to kind of look at that information, process it and encode it properly. Uh, 
you want to plan out your presentation in that outline in a way that helps you build a better PowerPoint. And so by first focusing on the content, how best to present it in this outline format, format it makes creating the PowerPoint easier and it actually enhances your talk. Simplicity is honestly the best thing you can adopt when it comes to creating a presentation. People come to hear you speak, right? Not to be distracted by your slides or to spend time listening to you speak while they're reading the, uh, you know, um, giant novel that's there on the screen for them to kind of digest. Slides should have lots of uh, white or negative space. And by white space, I don't mean it has to be white, right? Uh, it can be at any kind of solid color uh, that, that then calls attention to the important things, which are the, the kind of limited numbers of words that you've got there on your slides. The less clutter that you have on your slide, the more powerful the content that you do have will become, right? So we're gonna look at that slide and rather than seeing you know, 72 words, we're gonna see six. And that lets the audience member know that those six words are really important. So a faux pas might be if you're looking at um, creating a, a great slide is this. This is way, way overkill, right? It's overly complicated. Audience members don't know what to look at first. They don't know what's important information for them to, to pull from this, as opposed to this previous slide, which talks about simplicity being the sophisticated option here for us. So you want to avoid something like this. Just keep it simple. Which takes us to the 10, 20, 30 rule by a gentleman named Guy Kawasaki. And it, this relates more to business presentation. So I'll talk about how we can extrapolate it to a, a lecture, for example. But what the 10 stands for is 10 slides. You want to limit your presentation to 10 slides if it's 20 minutes long. So essentially uh, one slide, two minutes each. The 30 is the important part here. It's that 30 point font. You wanna make sure that your font is easy to read. So when we used to be able to do these things live and you would have somebody sitting at the back of the room or the classroom or the you know, lecture hall or you know, like the conference room, you want people at the back of the room to be able to read the information on your slide. And the best way to do that is to maintain a minimum of a 30 point font. The, the kind of bonus of using this larger point font is it's actually going to force you to limit the number of words on your slide. So let's extrapolate this to a synchronous lecture, right? And we'll say we have an hour long lecture. So the number, the Guy Kawasaki rule that we're going to kind of extrapolate is going to be, um, it's going to be, sorry, uh, 30, 60, 30. It's going to be 30 slides, uh, 60 minutes, but we're still maintaining that 30 point font. So this applies to both the asynchronous lectures, uh, the remote synchronous lectures, it uh, relates to your in-person lecture. And if you have a longer lecture, you know, try to keep those things in mind. If it's 75 minutes, I mean, you can do the math and figure out, I'm not gonna do the math right now. My brain is multitasking and I'm not capable of doing the math right now. But um, using this rule allows you to, A, when you're creating your PowerPoint presentation, estimate how many slides you're going to be able to fit into a certain time period. And it, it prevents you from adding too much text, and it allows the audience you know, a better viewing experience. So what we're going to do uh, when you're doing a presentation with the Guy Kawasaki method here is you're going to spell out the important nuggets in the first few minutes, right? And, and you're going to minimize the number of words per slide. Ultimately, what it ends up looking like is anywhere between 15 or 25 words, depending on, you know, your audience, etc. So if you can't summarize an entire slide full of 100 words, 250 words, whatever I've seen on some slides, right? We've all been there. Um, then you maybe want to think about how maybe this information doesn't all belong on, to, on one slide. Maybe I need to divide it out into two slides. So the key is to looking at the information that you're trying to present and saying, how can I condense this down? How can I think like a newspaper editor? 
and say, what are the key elements that I need them to pull from this? Put that in there. Some people suggest that you only add six words per slide as a maximum. Uh, this tends to be more relevant for like marketing or business proposals. For academics, I would say we would shoot more for 25. Oh, sorry, I skipped my own slide there. The uh, 2020 rule, uh, on the other hand, is if you have a 20 minute long presentation, you have 20 slides and each slide uh, last, I'm sorry, you have 20 slides and each lasts approximately 20 seconds. And this was kind of uh, really released into the world by Steve Jobs and his presentations, right? He would go through his presentations and he would do, uh, he would just have one word on the slide with a great image and he would forward through his messages and it, and it looked kind of great. It was a single concept or point per slide. And it was matched with these super stunning visuals and it's actually very effective. Uh, you can intersperse this technique, this technique though, uh, with that 10, 20, 30. So if you have some important things that you want to talk about that you might need to spend a little bit more time on, for example, uh, you're, in your introduction, you're going to spend two minutes on that slide, and then you're going to go through like a real quick uh, overview of what you're going to talk about. You can use this 2020 rule by going click, click, click click right through your, your presentation slides. And it's actually very, very effective. And you can do that throughout your presentation, actually. The, the interleaving of the, the 10, 20, 30 and the 20, 20 rule can make your, your 60 minute presentation a little bit more digestible for the, the students that that quick little break for the 20, 20 is enough to get their, their brains refocused. They might, they might have, you know, like dozed off a little bit or their attention starting to wave. And then you switch your presentation style there and you, you get their attention back. And then you can go back to that 10, 20, 30 rule. So this is an example of what Steve Jobs would have done. It's high impact. This presentation, this kind of image right here is, is high impact. You don't need to say much about it. Spend 20 seconds on it and you, you go back and forth. You weave those presentation styles. You talk about, you have those longer sections, and then you have this where you're just talking for 20 seconds at a time. One thing that's particularly hard for academics, I have to say, myself included, is how to be a text miser, right? How to keep as many of those, those nickels and, and dimes and pennies, which you know kind of relate to our word usage in our piggy bank and spend as few as few of them as possible in writing. We're gonna save all those for the delivery, for us sharing these words with our students verbally rather than on the screen. And so to do that, we try to ascribe to these, these specific word limits. We want one main idea per slide. We want a maximum of six bullet points with a maximum of six words per bullet point. And we want to use bullet points instead of sentences, particularly instead of paragraphs. So um, if you think about how uh, an individual reads and human factors engineers actually explore uh, methodically uh, in research how individuals read online. And what they see is this typical F pattern. And it's an F pattern because first people scan across the top of, the, of an online item, then they scan down the side, and then they scan across the center. And what they're doing is we anticipate seeing a title and then we look down the, the length of the side of the document where we see, you know, like how many paragraphs are there? Are there bullet points that denote um, kind of like main points? Are there numbers which denote a list or a sequence of events? And paying attention to how people read then in that F structure helps us set up our PowerPoints in a way that kind of leverages the way that they read. So if we have a single title, a short title on our PowerPoint slide, and we need to convey information, using bullet points is actually a way to trigger our brains to paying more attention to those items because we've been conditioned to think that bullet points are important. So using bullet points and limiting the amount of text that follow those bullet points will help. It allows people to scan more quickly and actually to hold that information in their working memory as you're talking. So if you have a really wordy phrase that you need to use or a statement that you need to make, you wanna to try to 
think about how can I make this more concise? How would I use this in a subject line on an email that I'm sending out to somebody? How would I, how would I tweet it in the old days, right? When it was um, much shorter, like 120 uh, characters, et cetera. So think of them as, as many, many tweets now and, uh, or those email subject lines. That's gonna help you be miserly with your text there. So here's a faux pas about too much text. And if we're thinking about an individual who's looking at our presentation and we're thinking about the way that human beings read text across the top, down the side, and then across again, what they're gonna see is they're gonna read this big title here, and then they're gonna see those, those dots, but then they're gonna come across this mass of text. And I just use kind of boilerplate uh, lorem ipsum text that people use to fill um, websites when they're building them before they, they put the actual text in there. But you can see how much text is there, how many sentences are there per paragraph, and that's overwhelming to the person who's reading this and trying to listen to you at the same time. It's, it's absolutely uh, making two parts of their brain work simultaneously. And if you were there at our 10 a.m. talk today, you learned that humans aren't very good at multitasking, right? So we wanna reduce the amount of text here into these kind of shorter, um, shorter uh, bullet points like this. Make them short, six words no longer after each of those bullet points. But what you might run up uh, against is this kind of belief that we need to share that information with our students. Or you might run up against students who are demanding that you share information with them. So when I first started teaching back in the classroom after teaching online for a long time, was I went with the 1020 rule in my presentations and students panicked because they didn't have information to take down as notes. And it took me a while to find a nice compromise with my students. So instead of just six words per, per slide, I was increasing to about 25. But you have to think about how you can work with your students to make sure that they're actively listening to you and still able to write down the gist of what you're saying. And we'll go over some real good techniques um, in depth on Friday at 10 o'clock if you'd like to join us for that presentation. But just really quickly, you can provide um, guided notes, right? So if you wanna provide your PowerPoint presentation to them ahead of time with the notes section filled in, they don't have to spend as much time writing while they should be listening to you. You could also contemplate giving them guided notes where they have a document that has the keywords that are on your PowerPoint, and then they can write what they're taking from what you're saying down next to them. You can do a com combination of the two that forces them to be listening, to, to kind of integrate what you're saying and write down their, their interpretation of what you're saying. And then they can compare it to the notes section on your PowerPoint later to make sure that they weren't missing anything. This allows students uh, to take ownership of the information that they're taking from your presentation. And it actually makes it more meaningful and literally helps them remember better. You could also provide them with a written summary of your presentation. So uh, you could come up with a white paper per presentation that you just give them and they could read it uh, like, like uh, the text of a, a, a video, right? Or you can uh, supply them with a Google Doc link so rather than printing out paper and handing it to them, you could supply it that way. You could upload it into your learning management system. The trick is to figure out which uh, method is going to work best for you and your students or to your audience. So Trevor um, wrote, how do we balance slides for our asynchronous versus synchronous students? You know, that's a great question. And what we find when we look at what students are accessing in the learning management system, most students aren't actually um, looking at PowerPoint presentations. They aren't downloading them. They don't, they're not as helpful to students as you might imagine. So uh, for your synchronous students, you know, doing something like this, allowing them to, forcing them, encouraging them to do that active learning where they're taking those notes, maybe breaking up your presentation, stopping so that they can write down the gist of what you just had in that slide might help them. For the asynchronous students, hopefully now after a year of teaching remotely, we have a sufficient number of recorded lectures so that they can do similar at home. They can watch, they can pause, they can write things down, they can continue to watch and rewind. 
But otherwise, if you're just uploading your PowerPoint with no context, with no uh, explanation, you might as well just be giving them a document with all of that information on it rather than making them progress through slides, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question, Trevor? Okay, great. So that brings us to keywords. And keywords, as I'm telling you to try to be a text miser and reduce the amount of text that you have on a page, those keywords become really important. The words that you're putting on your screen are kind of indicative to your student what's most important for them to know. When you're using those keywords, it's important to use consistent text formatting. So if, say for example, I'm doing a lecture or I'm doing a series of lectures over the course of the semester. Anytime I have a word that is going to be a kind of a, a glossary word or um, a word that they're gonna need to know the definition of in order for them to succeed on the exam, et cetera, or to do well with later material, I consistently underline that word. I put the word underlined and that, that kind of denotes to students after the first couple of lectures, like, hey, this is an important word for you to pay attention to and you should know the definition of it. You don't have to use the way I format it, but whatever uh, formatting you do use, be consistent throughout so that if a student were to look at uh, the, uh, to attend your lecture for, um, you know, the first lecture or the 16th lecture, they understand that, hey, this always means this. And, and that kind of prompts them like, oh, this is an important word and I need to know the definition. The formatting can help you so that after the first one or two classes, you don't need to describe why that word is important. Um, you can use, you know, bold or underline or highlights to do that. But I do want you to be mindful for your students who have accessibility concerns, for students who have uh, visual impairments or colorblind um, or using a screen reader. Some of these key points that we're, or keywords that we're using this consistent formatting is not necessarily going to be um, as identifiable to them. So you might want to consider other ways to provide this co contextual cue to your students, such as using the, uh, the heading settings in your, in your document or in PowerPoint, like this is heading one or heading two, or this is normal text. And that allows a screen reader to give the student um, kind of that context that's so important about why that word is important. When you're doing hyperlinks, you know, make sure that you use the traditional format where you're, um, it's the most accessible format, by the way. So you type the word, you highlight it, and then you add the link behind it. Uh, that makes it easier for a student with um, the screen reader to understand what that link is going to take them to rather than seeing, you know, www.cnn.com, they'll see, um, you know, CNN as the word and when they click on it, it takes them to CNN. What we also see though with the screen readers is it actually provides a list of all the links provided on that particular page. And if there is no text overlaid on top of the hyperlink, they just see a series of links and they don't know where it takes them to. So consider that when you're doing your hyperlinks in any of your documents and or presentations. So let's talk about some formatting concerns and formatting you know, deals with things like color, uh, it deals with font, it deals with animations, graphics, themes, et cetera. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about those next. Color, I mean, how many of us have seen uh, PowerPoints that burned out our retinas. You know, please feel free to, to post any comments you've had about, about color. Like even when I did that, uh, simplicity is the, the best, uh, best sophistication or I forget the words on it, that bright yellow slide, that can be overwhelming to people's eyeballs, right? We have, we have photoreceptors in our eyes that are sensitive to brightness and they can actually run out of something called rhodopsin. And so it kind of causes eye strain and we wanna limit the use of color. So originally this, this color um, palette that I have on my slide was this really bright, vibrant color. And so what I did was I used a uh, PowerPoint designer to kind of mute it out a little bit. So it became less of a, an eyesore and more like we can still see that there's a um, like a rainbow of colors there, but it doesn't cause us any eye strain. 
when we're talking about color, in addition to like the eye stream, we wanna make sure that we are, are using high contrast colors. And this is for accessibility concerns, but it's also relevant to the ease of people being able to read your PowerPoint. So I tend to work with dark colors uh, and extremely uh, light colors. I either have a black background with white text or I have a white background with black text. Oh, Dave, I see this crime all the time, yellow text on lime green background. And that is a hard for students who have um, like a, a reading disability or they have uh, are colorblind. It's hard for them to see a gray on gray tone, especially if it's that lime green and yellow, it's very challenging. Um, so make sure when you're choosing those colors that they're very different from one another. You can go with dark blue and white, or you can go with uh, a dark gray and white, but just try to make sure that they're sufficiently um, separate. The contrast is sufficient between the two. If you need to use like a yellow color to uh, highlight something, to call attention to something, a little bit of yellow or a little bit of bright color isn't bad. It's just when it's like that bright yellow as Dave said, with a green background. You wanna to try to stick overall with your presentation to fewer than five colors. Like I tend to pick a theme and I'm gonna have things mostly gray, dark uh, gray and black with white text, or you know, like I, I sometimes will shift those around. If you stick to that color scheme and you stick to the fewer number of colors, it's actually easier for the, the audience member to take in that information. It's less distracting and uh, it just looks better. So to go along with Dave's comment here about the lime green background, this was uh, a slide here that you'll wanna check out. Almost exactly what Dave was describing, except the opposite. We have this, this bright neon green color with this yellow text that's kind of hard to distinguish against the background. The white and the, the dark blue of the Trello uh, uh, kind of icon does stand out from the green and that's kind of sufficient. But otherwise, some of the other items, particularly the red, falls into that. And when you think of somebody with a red green color blindness, they're gonna see gray on gray and we don't know how they're distinguishing those grays from one another or if they even can. So we wanna avoid using colors like this, particularly green on red together. Uh, you can see down here with the, the kind of line across the lower portion of the presentation with the word ouch there, that that bright white, that pure white against the green, there is sufficient contrast. So if you wanna play with white in that green with just a little bit, you might have a white background with a little bit of green. You can probably play with that. Otherwise, this is definitely a color com combination that you wanna avoid. So let's talk about font. As, as I mentioned with the Guy Kawasaki rule, the, the 10, 20, 30, that, 30 point font is kind of key when you're doing these presentations. It makes it really visible to anybody in the back room. And it also makes you limit how much uh, font or how much text you put on the screen. For a title, you wanna go 40 and above. And for the text size, you really wanna shoot for 30. The style that you wanna choose as far as what type of, uh, do you wanna use Times New Roman? Do you wanna use Calibri? Any sans serif font is good. And what sans serif means is sans means without. Serif is kind of any embellishment on the ends of letters. So if you think about Times New Roman, that looks like this, uh, what I have here on the, the image here with the A, B, C, D, E, F. You can see the little flourish at the top and bottoms, the ends of all of the letters. And for individuals with reading disabilities like uh, dyslexia, those flourishes can actually be confusing to them. So choosing a sans serif font makes it easier for individuals with dyslexia and other forms of learning disabilities to read your PowerPoint. So we wanna stick with um, uh, fonts like uh, Arial, Calibri, Futura, Tahoma, any of those that don't have those, those flourishes on the ends of them. My go-to is Calibri. I think that it's, it's the best looking. Other people go with Arial. I have no objections to any of the four I just mentioned. And there are probably others that are sans serif that are good. 
Um, despite the fact that Times New Roman is kind of the default, we do want to try to move away from, from that in order to facilitate learning in all of our students. So animations. We want to limit the use of animations. I'm a big user of animations, but I have to do it judiciously, and I'm only going to do it when it serves a purpose. So what I'm going to do is, oh, I didn't, I took it out. <laughs> I used to have a, uh, a uh, hamster uh, GIF, GIF, we had this argument earlier this week that would, you know, just zoom in on the, the hamster and back out again. So you want to limit the use of those because it can be distracting. People spend more time looking in that. Our brains are kind of predisposed to looking at things that are changing. And so that movement is calling our attention to that. We're paying attention to the, the GIF rather than paying attention to what the person is saying. We want to make sure that if we do add it, that the, those animations are purposeful. And I'm not just talking about uh, GIFs at this point either. I'm talking about all the tools that PowerPoint has to, to have words fly in, right? The one that I just did this here, right? So we want to make sure that the use is limited, that it's purposeful, that it's subtle. We don't want it to fly in, spin around seven times, and then finally land or slowly expand and, and pop there. And we definitely want to avoid sound effects if at all possible. For some reason, that tends to turn our audience members off, is particularly if if they're um, if they kind of are shocking or surprising, and then they spend more time focused on that and less on the material. So here's an example. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot I added these slides. I I should talk, I should look through my presentation first. So anyway, these are the preferred fonts, Arial, Calibri, Tahoma. You could also use Futura, anything sans serif. And then we wanna avoid doing things like this, distracting or dizzying, right? We wanna avoid those when we're using animations. So let's talk about graphics. The use of high quality graphics, including photographs like the one on the left or on the one on the right here, are really effective. You can use your own, you can use publisher provided images, you can use stock photography, etc. You just have to be careful about copyright issues. My personal favorite is Canva, and I talk about Canva a lot. It's amazing. And uh, it provides me with lots of great pictures, and not only great pictures, but um, inclusive pictures, it, uh, demographically, uh, eth it, they're kind of ethnically diverse and so that I can make sure that my audience member feels included in my presentation by making sure it's representative. Using uh, images from clip art uh, may end up undermine kind of the professional look of your presentation. So if possible, you know, avoid them if you can, unless you're, of course, using them as an example here to, to demonstrate why you should not use clip art. Fortunately, um, PowerPoint has access to much better uh, images than it used to. It used to just have kind of like the cartoony clip art. It's getting much more like the, the graphic here on our right. So uh, here it is. Limit your use of GIFs, right? So here's the, the hamster and it's calling everyone's attention here to the slide and they're gonna stare at this hamster despite how cute it is. And it's going to kind of uh, undermine the uh, attention that people are giving to the presenter and they're going to spend more time looking at this GIF, plus then it gets repetitive, it does the same thing over and over again. So if you're going to use them, make sure that you are using these in the kind of 2020 rule slides where you're only going to have them up briefly, you're not going to say very much, and it's done purposefully to uh, call attention to something in specific. So I put this in here to call attention to how distracted, distracting these are. Yes, Megumi, even I'm getting distracted because I do love a hamster. I think they're absolutely adorable. Their little feet are just ooh, so cute. Um, and Jay posted, I've also had good experiences with free images at uh, pexels.com. Thanks for sharing that, Jay. That's always good to have um, nice free access to stuff like this. So let's talk about themes then. We want to avoid the PowerPoint templates, right? They are, they're, they tend to be overused. You've seen them six or seven times. Uh, you wanna 
maybe consider just creating your own theme. If you have access to um, the designer feature in PowerPoint, you actually don't have to use the themes. You can use designer to make your presentations look a little bit better. That's what I've done in every single one of my presentations that, that you've already seen and that you'll continue to see throughout the week. The, the designer in PowerPoint kind of takes the image that you've put in there and makes it look a little bit better than just the square that we typically get there. You might want to consider a theme per topic. So if you have um, a course that's delivered over the, the period of 15 weeks and you have broken it up into specific themes, right? The first section of my, my course focuses on neuroscience. The next one focuses on learning and memory. And then we're going to talk about personality. And then we're going to talk about um, like uh, the DSM, like the diagnosable disorders in individuals. And so each of those, when I lecture, has a different theme, but I stick to that same theme, those same colors, the same layouts for the entire section of that, um, that, of that course. All my neuroscience are gonna be black and white. All of my personality ones end up being this deep blue and, and white and gray with a little bit of yellow, et cetera. And so that, uh, allows students to kind of get an idea when they're thinking about something, if they're thinking about, if they're like me and they, they think back to notes and they can see the color of it, they actually know what section it is just by the color of the, the background kind of thing. So, so consider that, or maybe a theme per course. Uh, so it might be even more helpful to you. You're like, you pull up a slide and you're like, oh yeah, this is for Psych 110 or this is for 224, et cetera whatever works best for you. Just make sure that, you know, when you're using this consistency that, that you stick to it, you don't, um, unless you want to do it intentionally, pop in something different that stands out at your students, um, but you try to be consistent throughout the entire presentation. Use color well, right? We wanna make sure that we continue to use those high contrast pictures, uh, colors. So let's talk about graphs. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this session who uses graphs or graphics to tell a story to our students because sometimes those graphs can help us describe something um, visually for somebody that they, they can't grasp kind of just thinking about it in an abstract way. And so we use graphs, but we need to use those wisely. We need to pay attention to what type of slide we're using, and then how much information we're presenting per slide. These are excellent examples of graphs that are overwhelming, that we will spend more time trying to figure out what it's trying to tell us than is actually useful. So when you're considering a presenting a table as a chart, um, you might want to, uh, well, when you're considering presenting a table, you might want to consider presenting it as a chart. It tends to have more impact. So rather than showing, you know, this Excel table of tons of data, showing it as a, a, an image and as a chart is, is often more impactful. So we want to think about what types of graphs, you know, a pie chart shows percentages of things. You know, if we have, when we did the question at the beginning of the, the series this week, how many of your courses are going to be taught online, face-to-face, -face, synchronous, remote, etc. And we wanted to see percentages. That's when we use the pie chart. How many of the pieces of this pie are going to be taught fully online? How many are high flex, etc. That's when we uh, want to make sure to use the pie chart. But when we do use the pie chart, we want to make sure that we're limiting how much information is shared overall. These small slices, it's almost impossible to determine what, especially up in the top left-hand corner of that pie chart, seeing Kansas, Arkansas, and Mississippi, those numbers are all overlapping if there's so much information there. So consider how you might be able to show that information a little bit differently. You could say, you know, like the bulk of the, the cases of COVID right now are in certain states. And then, so you would show that maybe as um, all the other states as a big piece of the pie, and then the other, uh, the five states that are leading in the COVID cases uh, in, in uh, smaller pieces of pie. And then you could break up and then another pie chart, all of those other cases. What does it look like for these other states kind of thing? So there are ways to break up your graphs a little bit better. 
when you're using vertical bar charts like this one on the, the right, you use that to show changes in quantity over time or changes in something over the course of another. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're limiting our bars to four to eight. Otherwise, what we see here with the export of bananas, uh, it gets really confusing. Like what is that hot pink number in the middle, a uh, hot pink um, kind of bar in the back? What does that actually represent? And that's going to get challenging for people. Also, the use of colors in these is really tough. So imagine you're colorblind trying to determine the difference between some of these, and I imagine it's fairly challenging. The same is true for horizontal bar charts as with vertical bar charts and with line charts. And those line charts are used to uh, demonstrate trends, right? Those, those line charts. When you're using them, you don't wanna have too many items being compared at one time. So here again, I'm going to talk about the PowerPoint designer, and it gives us design suggestions. So if I were to be preparing the slide in PowerPoint, I might put a title on, I might create a slide that has the title and then two, two boxes in it, and I could put text or images or a video into either of those boxes. And in one, I put these uh, couple of bullet points, right? I'm sticking, sticking to that couple of bullet points, no more than six, no more than six words per bullet point. And then I put an image in that other square. And if I click on the design tab in PowerPoint, uh, it actually gives me a whole bunch of options, like which do you prefer, which do you think looks better? And, and then you can choose something that's kind of appealing. Note to self, always explicitly explain what the axes represent, even if you, Oh, the axis. Oh, the axes. Sorry, I was thinking axes in uh, Lumberjack. Yes, even if you think they're obvious. That was uh, one thing today when we were talking about the yerkes dodson curve earlier in the brain science where we were talking about uh, stress level and optimal performance. So you have to describe what's being measured and demonstrated. This is how stressed you are. This is your level of performance. And wherever you fall on that line, right, and explaining it that way, uh, makes it much um, more salient to the student they're paying or the attendee, they're paying more attention to what that graph is trying to convey. Thanks for that mention, Megami. So a good PowerPoint deserves a good presentation. You've spent all of this time creating this brilliant presentation. You know, it looks great. It's accessible to your students. It is dynamic, it's got uh, great images in it, uh, it, it's not overwhelming with text. And now you wanna go in and give a good presentation. And there's nothing worse than going into a presentation and having somebody read in a monotone as they're describing what's going on in the slide, et cetera, et cetera. You wanna make sure that you're paying attention to um, the way you're presenting your presentation as much as what you're doing when you're presenting. So check your work. And there's, <laughs> I got called out on this and I'm so grateful for whoever it, I did it. Their name wasn't attached to their Zoom identity, but you know, that little slide I have uh, in between sessions with the, the otters playing lovely there at the Monterey, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Well, I had to retype it uh, because uh, when I went to, play it on Monday morning, it turns out that Vancouver Aquarium, which we'd been watching in June, no longer has a live otter cam. So I had to change it around and I mistakenly deleted the text in addition to the link to the video. So I typed it out really quickly and I did not reread it. And so it was pointed out today that instead of shortly, I wrote shorty. And that's a good indication of where spell check, even if you use it, won't help you because shorty is actually a word. And <laughs> even though I meant shortly, shorty showed up. So uh, it's important to read your work uh, for spelling mistakes, even though spell check is kind of automatic in PowerPoint. What I find helpful is I read the words backwards and that way I'm not paying attention to context. I'm paying attention to spelling of an actual word. It tricks your brain. You're not anticipating what the next word is. You're not filling in those letters. Like this image here on the right, we see they always check for spelling mistakes. Um, our brains are designed to read that as correct, even though it's not correct. And um, 
So we want to make sure that we're we're not cheating ourselves out of out of that information. All right. So next, you could always use the outline view or the slide sorter. That um, you want to make sure that when you're looking at your slides overall, when you've you've put them all together, like, does this make sense? Does the start to finish uh, tell a good story? Is anything kind of standing out? Does something deserve to be somewhere else? And so what I do when I'm done with the presentation is I put it in slides order and I look at the overall context of it and like, do I need to shift anything? And what I did with the presentation with that Courtney and I did today, we were actually talking about the hippocampus earlier in the presentation, but it really fit better with the structures. Uh, so I ended up putting it later in the presentation. So using that outline view kind of helps you do, uh, do that a little bit easier. You can also see how your presentation is divided into segments and you can present your materials synchronously and then divide it out later for asynchronous presentation. So you're not doing a 60 minute presentation, you're doing like a six to eight minute presentation that uh, fits in better with people's ability to watch videos. And then make sure that you're consistent with your format. Are you using uh, uh, punctuation at the end of sentences or not? Whichever one you prefer to use, and people definitely have preferences about that, just make sure it's consistent throughout. And finally, I know I said it before, but spell check, spell check, spell check. And I was a victim of my own uh, rush to type things out this morning as an example. The other thing that helps with giving a good PowerPoint presentation is practice. And I actually practice my presentations in front of my poor kids, right? They have to listen to me do these sometimes. And I was up at 10 o'clock giving a, a presentation to my, my high schooler about uh, neuroscience last night, which hopefully I think they found pretty interesting, but you never know. Uh, one thing you can do if you don't have that canned audience is to use the PowerPoint coach. You, you put, turn the PowerPoint coach on, it's gonna pay attention to your timing. It's gonna pay attention to how many times you say words over and over again. So if you're someone like me who says write a lot or so a lot, it actually points that out so that you pay it. So in order for you to pay attention to those words and try to minimize their use throughout your presentations. <clears throat> There's a great quote here um, in, by Seth uh, Godin, Godin, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, and I'm going to let you read it, right? I said right again, that's one of my words that I say a lot. And the point here is not to read your slides. The point is to use the slides as cues for you to elaborate on the content. Your audience, again, came to listen to you speak to them not to read, not for you to read the slides to them. So you can uh, put this quote up here and have your audience read it while you're talking about something kind of complimentary. You can put a quote up in there and say, you know, I'm gonna put this up here and allow you guys to take a moment to read this, let this sink in, that's fine too. But my job isn't to be here and say, stop using your slides as a teleprompter. Slides should reinforce your words, not repeat them. That's the worst, right? I'm, I do this all the time, particularly when I only have two or three words on a sentence. But if you're going to kind of use it as a cue, just try to change things up a little bit to be different enough so that you're not reading directly from them. So if you're if you're doing this kind of thing, you're gonna encourage your, your uh, students or your audience members to just listen, not read. Uh, put details in your guided notes, have a handout to distribute after the presentation or in a Google Doc that you share the link to after your presentation or that you include during your presentation so maybe people can add notes to it as they go or put them in the notes section of your PowerPoint and share your slides with, with your audience members when you're done. I tell my students to save their ink and just listen. You know, I stop occasionally, I ask these kind of leading questions like, what did you just get from what I was saying? Or I use Kahoot or Mentimeter, right? As a way to kind of gauge whether or not they understood what I was just saying. And then during that time is when they're writing down like, oh, these were the important points. Uh, this is what I took from that. We need to remember that uh, participants read faster than presenters can speak. Um, sorry, I just wanna make sure I 
I didn't have a slide for that, uh, that students read faster than presenters can speak. So if you are reading text from the screen to your participants, they're reading faster than you are speaking. And now they're engaged in this dual channeling where the two primary modes of information absorption, both the reading and the listening are in competition with one another. So uh, that neither is actually winning. We're multitasking less well on each individual task. So again, don't read it, allow them to read it or you know, minimize that text so that there's not as much competition. It's better to have illustrations and short text summaries or keywords with the details presented in the narration. So again, we want to make sure that we're focusing whatever's on the, the slide should be the most salient, the most important information that the, the audience member is taking from that particular presentation. All right, so this brings us to storytelling, right? So you might have, I said right again, now I'm really super conscious of it because I called attention to it. We wanna make sure that uh, we talk about, um, as we're giving this lecture, we engage in storytelling. So I paused and I told you the story, the anecdote about how I typed shorty instead of shortly. Pausing and to engage in storytelling, adding in a quip or an anecdote, right, is helpful, especially if you do it strategically. When attentions are starting to wane, uh, maybe at the 10 or 15 minute mark, maybe even the 20 minute mark, just tell a little story. Do a little quip, maybe pair it with that 2020 uh, where you're flipping through slides really quickly as you tell the story kind of interval and that breaks up the lecture, gets people back on board with you, brings their attention back to your presentation. Don't be afraid to add a blank slide or, or just one with an image without words. This is going to prop, prompt you to engage with your audience. You're not looking at your, your PowerPoint trying to decide what to say. This is an opportunity for you to kind of talk to them um, don't hesitate to incorporate a whiteboard or other drawing tool to help you elaborate on your points or work with materials that don't necessarily fit into PowerPoint. Um, if you're presenting in Zoom, you can annotate your slides as you're speaking. You know, that might be great. And especially if you can figure out a way to save those annotations and students can refer to those later. It's really important to find your voice, which I'm about to lose here, and you want to project it as, as well as you can. It's one of the times that projection, and this is a psychology joke and I apologize, it's a, one of the times that projection is something that you strive for. You wanna make sure that you're speaking loudly enough that everybody can hear you. Uh, not shouting, but you know, projected. And you wanna try to be as entertaining as you can be without you know, being ridiculous. And you can do that by slowing down. My apologies, give me a second. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. I apologize. I'm not used to this much talking. I sneeze again. <laughs> and I have a laugh about, you know, things like sneezing and coughing in the middle of your session that happened. <clears throat> so you can express your personality. My apologies, I was muted at the wrong time. <clears throat> Do you wanna express your personality in the best? Let your students know uh, where you're coming from and um, what makes you passionate about the topic at hand. Oh, thank you for that. Somebody said gazoon height there in the private chat and I appreciate that. You wanna make sure that you, when you're expressing who you are to your students, to your audience members, they leave feeling connected to you, right? At the end of the course, the students are gonna remember more about, <clears throat> so sorry, about who you were as a professor, less about the content. And expressing yourself as a human makes them feel safe reaching out to you and promotes the feeling of safety and security in your classroom and makes for a better overall experience. So <clears throat> we have just a couple minutes left. How about anybody have any questions about presentations or other things they would like to know about presentations? And if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna put a cough drop in my mouth while I'm waiting for questions.
how many of you use PowerPoint versus slides or um, I forget what it's called in Mac. If you wanna put in the chat, which type you use or how many don't use slides at all when you're lecturing? PowerPoint. <coughs> PowerPoint. Yep. Okay. What is the challenges of using publisher prepared slides? I will say what I found with publisher prepared slides is A, they tend not to be accessible. And they tend to have an overabundance of text on them. So <coughs> that would be my hesitation about using. Um, the slides from a publisher, that doesn't mean you can't modify them, use similar information, just revamp it, put the information down in the notes and make it more kind of engaging. Uh, yeah, you can certainly use this presentation with your students. Yeah, I'll share the, the link is going to be shared on the Otter website, and you can absolutely use it with my permission to, to show them the best practices for presentations. But don't be surprised if you try to implement these in the classroom that you're gonna get some pushback against students because what we find with students is they have not been taught how to take notes properly. And so they get into the classroom, they're used to writing everything down that the teacher's writing down or has on their PowerPoint slide verbatim. And when you shift that paradigm around and you're presenting them with a limited amount of text up in front of them and they're forced to actively listen and then try to titrate down what you're saying into something salient for them to write down in their notes. It's challenging for them and you're gonna get some pushback, but that's okay as long as you tell them what you're doing. Like I'm doing this in order to make sure that you're actually learning this information better. And I know that you're addicted to copying everything down and I understand that. So I'm providing you with this text in another format that you can have later. But for right now, when you're in my classroom, I want you to listen and we're gonna pause occasionally and we're gonna take time to digest that information and then you can write it down. I agree, Dave, I used to hate PowerPoint. <clears throat> In fact, I did everything but PowerPoint. I used Prezi for a long time until I realized how inaccessible it was. And so then I switched back to PowerPoint to be more accessible. <laughs> so sorry, you guys, coughing and hacking over here. Agree, Dr. Steven there, publisher slides are usually exceedingly dry. Yeah, engineering slides are certainly going to be topics that are more challenging for you to condense the, the text, but that gives you an opportunity to use the whiteboard in addition to the text, right, on your PowerPoint. Do your slide, write something out that you need to for that particular thing, and then go back to the slides that are kind of geared better for audiences. Agreed, Stephen, the, the Lumen Waymaker slides, they are accessible, which is one of the great things about using OER materials, right? Their focus is on accessibility from the get-go, but again, they don't always follow that 10, 20, 30 guideline. That's smart uh, to use the publisher slides and then kind of rework them to look a bit better. Um, I'm still using Kahoot. There should be a free.edu account. I hope it didn't change over the summer. If so, then <laughs> I'm going to have to rethink some of the things I do in my classroom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jay, I have a lot more talking left to do. I'm going to go on a like a silent spree for the rest of this evening. Yeah, Prezi, when it was done well, it didn't necessarily make people motion sick, but it not done well. Yeah, it could, it could definitely make people feel dizzy. <clears throat> and I, I'm using Mentimeter now more, although I, I do the paid version, so I have more access to more questions. So I'll be using that uh, more for Kahoot in the lecture so that I can assess. I'm gonna do the kind of, you know, five to eight minutes of talking. I'll do the, the poll to kind of give people a break, judge whether or not they've gotten it. 
and then have them write down what they think was most important in the last couple of slides. All right, you guys, I appreciate your time and attendance here. We're gonna offer quite a few more strategies on Friday about how to kind of leverage your presentation with you know, brain science and with learning and memory uh, phenomenon and, and kind of create a lecture strategy that works best for you and for your students' brains. So I hope that you'll attend there and we'll go into more depth about those little breaks and what you should do in them. So thanks again, I'm gonna stop um, recording here. That's at 10 o'clock on Friday. We're gonna do all of the science of learning ones at 10.30.